<laughs> bye bye. Attenzione, eh. Chiave? <ride> Allì. Attenzione, vieni giù. No, vieni giù, vieni giù. Come fai? Questo è arrivato dall'Italia, questo è il pacco, tra l'altro, aspetta. Aspetta, lì, guarda, guarda, guarda. Istanbul in 1971. I was 25 at the time and um, people had told me that I can sell a car here, so I drove a car down here and suddenly I could not sell it, so I drove it back. <laughs> There was a Volkswagen bus from the post that I had bought. Anyway, At that time, Istanbul was crazy. It was a lot of drug addicts, guys who, are, were, who were on their way to Afghanistan and others who came back from Afghanistan or India or Nepal. And uh, that wonderful Sultan Ahmed Maidan, as you know it today, was a real big disaster. And uh, also the whole surrounding areas cheap hotels, guys who were trying to steal money or get drugs or, and so on and so on. So it was not funny. And I buy the 308 Mercedes diesel bus. My old, it was like a 16 passenger bus. I ripped out all the seats, put it into a, a hippie traveling wagon, complete with textiles and oil lamps on cantaloupe livers and whatever. And that became the vehicle that we used for the next years to ro roam around Turkey, go up into the villages. So now I've got the vehicle. I'd say, well, why don't we, why don't we, you know, look around for kilims here in Turkey and and uh, before we go go out east again. But at that time, there really weren't many people yet. It's still 1973. Really, I didn't go to the Middle East until I went to Turkey once, 1980. And I spent uh, two and a half months there. I went with a car. I drove out near Erzurum from Istanbul, 
looking for looking for carpet and to other places, but I'd never really traveled in the Middle East looking for carpets because I could find carpets in Paris or in London. Listen, I, can you believe, I might have lived with a Berber family in Morocco and I've been all over North Africa, you know, and I was down in the Sahara and I was da da da, but I've never been, <laughs> been to, per to Iran or Turkey. However, that's not, you know, often, I mean, it's so interesting, you know, again, carpet dealers would laugh at us, oh yeah, those kill him. They'd, they'd wrap, you know, we'd wrap bales of uh, rugs, but we'd we'd go to the um, in the East End by the custom sheds, and they'd have importation. Sometimes we could buy, you know, if something had come in, we could buy things. But I tell you, the best things we ever found had already come over here in the twenties and thirties. And over the years, well, in '72, I was on a trip to India myself. And uh, from that trip, I came back with eight rugs that I had bought, old pieces. And uh, so it went on. My parents had a linoleum, a floor cover, linoleum with a Harris design. Completely forgotten about that, but as a child, I was following these lines with my fingers. And I saw a carpet much later in about 78 in Iran which was exactly that design and suddenly click bang that must have been something there wanted to collect different things and carpets had a cachet had a vibration about them they had a mystique about them and uh, because that mystique was involved with the Near East were drugs. I think drugs had a lot to do with carpet collecting. In the old days, people used to say, oh yeah, rugs and drugs. So they had some relationship. They went to, for enlightenment, they went for consciousness, they went for drugs, and they went for textiles also. So I think this, my generation, was looking for, you know, something to do. People didn't necessarily go to work right away because of this desire to do something, you know, to do something different. Thank you. Thank you. Eh, ti piace questo Questa è come una, una porta. Eh? Attenzione, eh? Anyway, the guy comes in, he says, well, show me what you got. And I showed him, I opened up like, it was six or seven pieces. And he, he, he asked how much I wanted for each one. And, and, and I had no idea what to do, so I tripled everything. I took in my brain, I remembered what I paid for it, I multiplied it by three and I gave him a price. And he's looking, and then he goes over to the bug kilo, the, the race car kilo. They have these, like shields or insignia. <clears throat> some people think the shields look like race cars, some things that people think they look like bugs, so they call them bug kilo. I just looked at him and I said, well look, you and I both know that's the best piece. I, of course, I had no fucking idea whatsoever. So if you want a discount on that, why don't I just take them all with me and, and go home? And he said, uh, he didn't say anything. He waited about 20, 30 seconds, looked at things, kicked a couple with his shoe. And then he turned to me and said, okay, I'll take everything. It was very exciting. I remember the first killings uh, because A, they were about, they and Bellucci rugs. Red. They said, oh, yeah, those red and blue things, you know. Well, I love blue. They look like Mark, uh, really early. Uh, can be like a Mark Roscoe. And the wool quality, because I also do love pile. But, um, and because those keelings were, uh, you know, cheap, uh, then, well, that's how we managed to do it. But I still remember they're like sort of strange, you know, matchstick men you know, uh, but they they ca carry spiritual power, whereas, um, you know, these other motives 
which are not so figurative, well, it's because of Islam for a start, you know, doesn't want representation or, or animistic things. First of all, uh, um, the designs are, have nothing to do with the carpet. It was folk art done by villagers or nomadic people and not in workshops. That made, made a big difference. For In workshops you usually get designed pieces that are designed by a master and woven by a few women. And the killing was done by the people. And that is the importance of really old killings. But you have to go back three, four hundred years to find a killing with a language. When you look at early killings, there are lots of hidden things in there. There's a completely different space, spacing in it, in them. Uh, you can read basically two dimensions, the ground and the design. And very often this is mixed in a very interesting way, uh, in a hidden way, so to speak, uh, as most people didn't see it. When you open your, your eyes and you read plus and minus, it makes a picture. It's a big mistake to think that 200 years ago or 150 years ago even, that people were doing the same thing, that they had the same motivations, they had the same societal mores. I um, am very suspicious of modern ethnography. And see, I'm waiting, and I believe it's going to come, is that someone is going to find the travel log in 1400 where there are pictures of carpets, they're drawings. But so far that hasn't come. So, like Marco Polo says, I've seen the world's greatest carpets. Well, what the fuck does that mean? The carpets that he saw in Turkmenistan might have been made in Turkey, might have been made in China, they might have been made in Siberia. So, we, there's a big knowledge gap. That's why the only, I always say the only evidence that we have are the carpets and the weavings themselves. We have nothing else. Now we know that there are 16th and 15th century Gilans and Turkmen rugs and Anatolian rugs. So I think that, or if you want to call it craft, that's okay. But they were never made as a decorative object. They were not made to be used in a secular or profane manner. They were made to be used in a cultural or cult or spiritual or religious or, you know, other, other worldly manner. It's like in a year, people would make a kilim of a certain size to divide a sleeping area for the husband and the wife. We'd have some privacy from the other members of the family. Yeah, and there's a lot of fertility. It, it seems to have been a very strong element and it makes sense for children for the tool to survive. And it's still so. I mean, uh, from generation to generation, life changed. Today, the world is completely different. <laughs> Below my computer is a large hair stick that I had woven. The woman, I only gave her a picture of a 17th century hair stick. And she said, oh, well, I know this design. And she wove it just from memory. And it's, it's a beautiful piece with uh, very saturated colors.
it does not age, that's the big problem. After 30 years, it looked like done yesterday. <laughs> In the 19th century, it became a question of time. When you wanted to produce something and make money, you could not uh, uh, invest a lot of money into getting top colors. So this is also why chemical dyes were eventually found. And certainly with the speed of, of weaving, uh, the quality of the design disappeared. If you make if you make natural dyes on wool, this is the most vivid method to make natural dyes. Natural dye on wool is much much better than natural dye on silk because wool has a very complicated inner structure, a lot of dif different membranes, skins, and so. And uh, the natural dyes, if you make it right, also go in the fiber. I imagine you make you. You paint a, a color on, on, a, on a surface like a paper or some plastic sheet. Even if it's dry, it is, you can look through, through it, you know? Transparent in a way. But in wool, you have 10, 15 layers of this color. They call this lazur in German. And the more, the more layers you apply, the more vivid and the more colorful it, it will be. So wool, wool has this ability. Wool is the best material to show natural dyes, natural dyes from plants, better than any other material. The second thing is, a kill, uh, if, uh, imagine the situation a weaver sits in front of the loom. With a, with a kilim she can much more easily make some experiments, try something. With a carpet she cannot because the, the dyed wool in old times has been so expensive for these people that you, you, you cannot dare to, to make experiments. Therefore, uh, artistically, kilims are more creative or can be more creative. I've been learning from the old Jewish dealers there, and I had a great eye, a great eye for color. And, and that's when I made up the phrase, color doesn't lie. And there's, I've got a whole theory about about this. It's about the absorption and the reflection of light. Whereas organic colors tend to absorb light, uh, synthetic colors tend to reflect it, which jumbles up the image. And so when you say uh, two colors don't go with each other, or they don't, they uh, that color conflicts with that other color, they're wrong. Because if you go into nature, you can see 20 different flowers in a garden, and no color interferes. There's no such thing as a clack. Is light is being reflected, it's causing uh, a mixing of the signal in, in the opth ophthalmic nerve. But anyway, I, I kind of knew that instinctually, so I would just buy a color and sell, seldom made a mistake. What is the Lord? Well, I think the, the, the best and the easiest thing to do is what is your perception of it. So in other words, there's the object, not necessarily trying to understand what the person who made it, what their reaction was. It's impossible for you or me or anybody else to live the life that the woman who made or man who made that kill him was living. 
told this to many people, and I would appreciate it if you would keep it to yourself. I, I have communicated with people who were involved in carpets a long time ago, and I communicated spiritually on a non-physical level. We're talking on a very physical level here. My um, words, my idea is turned into a word. My mouth is creating that word. It's a sound vibration in you, whether you're on the telephone or sitting next to me, or then hearing that vibration in your ear, and then it is turned into an electronic um, something or other, and then it's in your brain. So I have learned about carpets from other people, physically, yes, from books, but the most I've learned is spiritually, because I know how to connect, and I know what the, um, I know what the formula is to create that connection. And um, if you're able to do that, then you can, you can see something from a different perspective. If you're lucky in life, where you find your way in life, that is the place, the area where their talent is, and are able to work or to live in that in that area. So I was very lucky that I, I found that. You know, but I didn't find it by accident. I found it through desire. All about desire. All about desire. All about desire. All about desire. All about